Hello, welcome everyone. My name is Gloria Masia and I'm doing this short video recording because I want to talk about a new white paper that the European Commission has recently released on artificial intelligence, a European approach to excellence and trust. So very shortly about myself. I am a data scientist. My background is in biomedical engineers. I did my master's at ETH here in Zurich. And I'm someone who is very passionate about uh, new technologies, innovation in the healthcare space. And also someone who worked for a while in quality and regulatory affairs and wrote um, her master thesis about it. So I also care a lot about how regulations might affect the innovation uh, ecosystem, how they may promote it, how they may endanger it, and also how they guarantee the safety of our patients. So those are the topics that interest me. And um, very soon I'm going to have an article coming about it in the, Nitro, in the Nature Biomedical Engineering Journal. So that if that's something that might interest you, um, just go ahead and read it. I'm, I'm happy to, to hear what you think about it. So how this idea of doing this uh, short video streaming started was um, with a friend. So um, Dorothea Barr, who is uh, truly an expert on AI ethics and very active on, on Twitter. And I saw one of her tweets in which she basically was um, talking about this first analysis on the UI paper and AI, uh, which is the work of these people you see here. And um, the people were criticizing how AI was presented in this white paper as a race. And that's something I also want to touch upon it. But I mean, that's how we started. So then we, we met, we discussed about it. And some of the ideas were so interesting that I thought, why not having an informal discussion recorded so that if other people think um, if other people think that's an interesting topic too and want to get involved, then they know what I thought. Um, yeah, so that's basically what I wanted to say here. Um, let's now jump to the white paper itself. And um, I think um, very, and I think what you should know is that I will be uh, constantly mentioning healthcare and the medical device regulation. And why this mention is not off is that even in the first line of this white paper, like literally the first line, it says AI is developing fast, no question about it. It will change our life by improving healthcare. So healthcare is literally the first application of AI that is mentioned in that white paper. And I would say, this already tells us a lot about how the regulators are thinking about this white paper. And what I dislike then is that they say against a background of first global competition. So you see here this uh, race, this war approach to AI, which I think it's not the goal. It's not on scope. Um, there is not a finish line. We are not competing. It's about fostering innovation. It's about being better. Um, solutions to our patients. So yeah, that would be also criticism from my side. And then they say based on European values, then I honestly never checked on European values before, but if you go European values promote peace, that's literally the first value. So I would say framing it in that way as a race, as a war, it's not promoting peace. Then in this paragraph, then you already see what this white paper is gonna truly be about. There are two key aspects. One of them is regulatory. So we are really talking about what do we have today? Um, what EU directive and legislations do we have? Do they, do they tackle the concerns that AI may bring or do we need something new on top of that? And spoiler alert, that's gonna be the conclusion. Uh, and then um, the other thing that's truly we are gonna be about is about investment. So how much money the EU Commission will put towards AI so that um, Europe stays in, in good shape. Um, I'm obviously going to be talking about more about the regulatory side than the investment, but I'm mentioning because I think both aspects are, of course, very important and um, that you should consider them. I'm peeping here at my notes. So yes, the next thing I wanted to mention and the only thing I actually wanted to mention about investment is on page four which it gives you um, some numbers about how much, uh, let me see which page I am. Okay, one more to go, of how much the EU has been investing. So they say in 2016, we're now 2020, the EU invested 3.2 billion. 
uh, which uh, it's not much compared to America, North America, who invested 12.1 billion and 6.5 billion in Asia. So I would say we are we clearly right need to increase this investment level significantly. And then I think it's interesting which. Um, the, ne the title of the next section, which is uh, Sizing the Opportunities Ahead, the next data wave, because put in contrast to the last one, to me, it's kind of saying we are here falling behind, but no problem, because we know that we are going to make it on the next round of the game. And they say um, today 80% and how we're going to make it is basically they say today 80% of this data processing occurs in clouds. And of course, we have no big European cloud provider because Google Cloud from Google, AWS from Amazon, Azure from Microsoft, there are all US-based companies. And in Asia, you have Alibaba Cloud. There is no EU equivalent, right? And the biggest tech company we have is Spotify. So that's something that concerns the EU industry. And they say, but look, no problem, because we know that the, the thing coming is edge computing. So um, it will be happening in edge devices and the EU is a global leader in low power electronics. Um, so and we even have this European um, processor initiative because the fact is that despite being a global leader, this market is currently dominated by non-EU players. So to me, um, yeah, yeah, I, I, I believe you get the point that I wanted to make in this section. Then, um, then to me, there is also here a sentence that um, why do they mention? So they say combining symbolic reasoning, that uh, this good old fashioned AI, that's rule based AI with deep neural networks may help us improve explainability of AI outcomes. I think it's quite a weak statement with this may help us. Um, not sure how this relates to the whole paragraph. Um, you will also see that in this white paper, they mention the environmental issues because um, yes, AI, it's very computationally intensive, requires a lot of energy. And this is then from the environmental side a concern. Uh, a very valid point. I also don't see how it fits into this white paper. And it's actually something that they mentioned once of if they wanted to tick some box. But then there are not concrete action points, which is what I'm truly missing. I like to see ideas, but I love to see action points. Then, um, then let's talk about money. They say the objective is to attract over 20 billion of total investment in EU per year. Uh, in AI over the next decade. Wow, that's I would say that's a big number here we are talking. Um, let's see how they do it. Um, what they say is that they mention the different programs the EU has, like the Digital European Program, the um, Horizon uh, Europe, and so on. They also mention this um, Europe, um, European Network of Digital Innovation Hubs. I honestly, as someone who is not playing into this space, I found it very interesting. So I, it's certainly something I will be privately exploring more if I ever want to get funding from the EU. And um, I'm mentioning it because you, if you are also an SME or a startup, you might want to explore it too. Then um, another thing that's important is that um, they talk about skills and they say about how important it is that we have in Europe more people that are skilled um, as a data scientist, that they are AI practitioners. And also they say that what they foresee is that these ethical guidelines that have been developed by um, this um, by this expert group of, um, of of AI in Europe, that they would be then be part of this curriculum. You see it here, these ethical um, guidelines be part of like a university curriculum, which honestly, um, I think it's an interesting idea. Um, and that's why I'm mentioning it. Um, then something that to me is a bit off is when they talk about um, promoting the adoption of AI by the public center. And why I'm saying it's a bit off is because you will see here they mention healthcare. And of course, I, I agree with the point. I see the concerns. But if you have worked in a hospital, um, I've been there. They even have in some of them fax machines in, in a few of them. Right. So that's where, where hospitals are today. So having AI systems um, adopted by the public sector itself, yeah, um, I think it's an interesting, it's, it's a bold point to make. Then, um, okay, then let's talk about, um, about how this potential regulatory framework 
it's going to look like. And what they do here is they talk about the, an ecosystem of trust. So that's the main goal of the system. If a technology has to be uptaken, they want to create trust, which said as such, it's a very general statement, it's difficult to argue it. It's also difficult to argue with the guidelines of the high level expert group, because if you read these principles, they are so generic that they, um, they do not really trigger a discussion. And to me, to have a discussion about ethics, um, um, maybe some of these points would have to be um, a bit more concrete so that someone can say, I'm against, for instance, transparency or I'm against diversity. If these statements are so, um, yeah, I, I would, I'm, my, the only point I'm trying to make here is I think it would be very hard to find someone who says, publicly I'm against diversity and yet I'm very sure that many of the systems that will be put into the market will have some bias that discriminate minorities. So, but yes, in any case, that's only a guideline that they are using as basics. So let's see how they plan to do it. And for that, you need to take a look at the problem definition, right? And what they say is, look, AI can do much good, but it can also do harm. And this harm can be material, so if it endangers the safety of the individuals, it can, um, if you think a medical device, it could be the loss of your life or permanent damage or immaterial, if just the loss of privacy, if you think about like facial recognition systems, right? So um, a good framework is the one that will tackle those risks and minimize them, but that's not only that, right? So also a very important part of regulation and even the most liberal people and defining here liberal as the ones who want free economy, little government involvement, they say liability is super important. So if something goes wrong, we want to know whom to blame and who should pay for it and to whom we address our claims. So they say three components, fundamental rights. So fundamental rights for to protect minorities, safety for, for instance, our patient and then liability. And then what they will be doing next is to see whether these points are addressed in the existing directive and regulations. Let me scroll a bit down. We need to now go exactly possible adjustments to the existing EU legislative frameworks relating to AI. So what they are basically doing here is we already have many uh, directives, many regulations. Are they enough or do we need something extra? So um, which um, the, the directives they are discussing, you find them here. I'm saying you find them here because if you take one of these numbers, then it's much easier to find the text. So for instance, I have here the text of the medical device regulation. That's truly one, what you want to look at. Um, and I'm saying that because I've seen many people um, kind of sometimes quoting, especially on the internet, some consulting websites, you really want to take a look at the legal text and then you really know what they are talking about. So the ones they are mentioning here are, um, for instance, the GDPR, the Consumer Rights Directive, the General Product Safety Directive. If you're not into it, the difference between a directive and regulation is that a regulation is directly applicable into uh, all European states, whereas a directive has to be translated to a national law. And I would say there is a trend um, going towards more uh, regulations and less directives. And that's, for instance, the case of the new medical device regulation before we had a directive. Um, but that's not always like it. And, and that's why, especially for the old ones, if they are um, from a few years ago, um, then um, they are directives. And the newer ones like GDPR or the MDR, they are regulations. That's why this trend. So what they are doing here is they are uh, touching upon different aspects. And one of them, for instance, is this liability that I mentioned. So they say, well, due to the lack of transparency of AI, it might be difficult to see where something has been wrong, where the product is truly defect, and then it will make it difficult for the consumer to claim compensation. So it's this liability issue and then claim compensation. And they are making the first point because it's also the one that triggers less discussion. Then they say, well, then there is the fact of scope. What happens with standalone software that use AI? Is it part of the product safety legislation or not? Then they, take, they, they talk about a topic that everyone loves discussion about, which is continuous um, learning systems. So if um, AI, it's just, or let's say 
um, a deep learning model is just a highly complex mathematical function that combines some linear functions and some nonlinear functions. Um, but, and then you could train this model and then you could deploy it. And then that would be basically just the software release. And then you could retrain it and redeploy it. And that would be another software release. But there's of course also the option of that happening very quickly once the product is in the market. And then the point they are making here is, and that's what we call a continuous learning system. And I would say they offer some opportunities, which is the fact that they can improve on the go. And they can, for instance, um, adapt to the local population, but of course also some challenges from a regulatory perspective, because if you had a conformity assessment, a pre-market conformity assessment procedure, what happens if the product changes while it is on the market? Um, does it still maintain the C marking? And that's what they discuss here. Then they talk about the, again, about liability, about responsibilities within the supply chain. So if more than one agent uh, is involved in the making of an AI product, which is highly likely, maybe a company does the AI algorithm, another company does the interface, and finally there is a big company that um, puts it into the market or under his name, who is responsible. And finally, they say there are a few points that we believe they are um, unique to this technology or unique to a few technologies. And they talk, for instance, about cybersecurity, which is one of these other hot topics that will be not be properly addressed in any or in very few documents, but will be mentioned in all of them. And here I just want to say from as a perspective of someone who um, loves the medical device industry, most of these aspects are already addressed in the FDR. So um, the person who's liable, coming to the first point, is the manufacturer who registers the medical device under his name. And he's also the one who has to be responsible for taking care of the whole supply chain. So that's something we have already um, addressed. Then a stand limitations on scope regarding standalone software, that's for us also not an issue because um, standalone medical devices are still medical devices, hence are under the scope of the MDR. Then um, the changing functionality of AI, this is something not addressed in the MDR, but if you go to FDA website, so FDA is the Food Drug Administration, is the agency taking, it's the executive agency of the United States taking care um, of regulating um, drugs and also um, food and medical devices. And they have released recently um, a guideline that they precisely touch upon this point. Sorry, yeah, a white paper the they touch um, upon this point. So I would say not in Europe, but there are some other places in the world that maybe are because they have invested more money on it or because they have um, a more um, vibrant tech industry that are already having this discussion with legislators. Um, yeah, and I think that's basically the point I want to make. Here they um, justify with these claims and they conclude, which it's to me uh, a jump saying that um, a new legislation may be needed. And I honestly ask me, what do they mean by may be needed? Are they concluding that they will be putting a new um, regulatory framework or are they concluding they are not putting a new regulatory framework? So this conclusion and this may makes it to be a mid confusion, but it, it looks like um, this may is a yes. So they then talk about which would be the scope. And of course, to have a scope, you first need to define AI as you need to in the MDR to define what's a medical device. And then they say, well, that's fine because we have this communication of the EU Commission that was there further refined by the high level expert group. That's what I mentioned before. The ones that released these guidelines with the seven key principles that I said that sometimes they appear to me as someone who's developing technology a bit big. Um, and here they say the main elements of AI are data and algorithms. That's an interesting point because if you go to one of the first pages, they will say that the main elements are data, technology, and compute power. And here the definition is in consistent. But we are not going to get too picky on that. Um, I think the point is that they're saying, yes, we need a definition to AI so that we know what's in scope. And we are going to use a risk page approach. Again, nothing not new in highly regulated industries like medical devices we have classes classes are related to risk the higher your risk the more controls you have to 
uh, undergo in order to put your medical device on the market. So initially it looks like as if this framework was to be for high risk um, devices. Then of course the next question is what is high risk or how do you define high risk? And they say they are going to use um, the following uh, two cumulative criteria. So first one is the sector in which this um, AI product will be used. And surprise, surprise, the first sector they mention is healthcare. Um, then the second factor, because it's cumulative, right, is not only the sector, but um, the, so to say, the intended use. Um, so they say um, that, for instance, uh, a healthcare a system that's used to for, for scheduling appointment in a hospital may then not be um, high risk and might not be then under the scope of this may becoming new framework. Um, I don't think it's a great example because um, under the current MDR, um, these scheduling systems are not considered medical devices. This is uh, because they don't have these medical intended use. So they are not under the scope of the MDR. So I can also understand that they will not be under the scope of this new framework. I think here I would have expected the authors of this white paper to give an example of first a medical device that would be under the scope of this um, framework and a medical device that because it's not high risk would not be under the scope of this framework um, and that's what i would have been expecting and yes so we have these two cumulative criteria but wait then it says notwithstanding the foregoing there also might be exceptional instances um okay so it's not that simple here i see kind of um, a group of people reserving a right again to put as many exceptions as they would like to and they, for instance, mention software, AI software being used in the recruitment process. To me, the question is whether this should be allowed at all, whether it's the best possible use of AI. And then they talk about, interesting, remote biometric identification. And to be honest, the first time I read it, I was like, I'm not sure what that means. But if you scroll a bit down, you will find here nearly hidden what they mean by remote biometric identification. And they talk about, it's about identifying multiple persons with fingerprints, but look at that, facial images at a distance in a public space. So this is using essentially AI for facial recognition in the crowd for mass surveillance. And this is one of the use cases they consider. Then, when I looked at that, I thought, wow, that's super interesting. Are they going to ban it? Are, how are they going to be approaching it? So here we'll see the, the requirements, but I'm going to skip it. I'm going to skip it because I don't consider it's, it's a technical, interesting point to discuss. I think um, it's a good starting point, but what I really want to focus is on this uh, mention of facial recognition. So what do they think? So for that, we have to scroll a bit down because we have to skip all this section. Human oversight, something a bit big, they have to define it more in my opinion. Uh, yeah, there we go. So this paragraph, that's very key. So they say basically under GDPR, um, the processing of biometric data for the purpose of uniquely identifying a natural person is forbidden, except under specific circumstances. Okay, interesting. So what do they mean? So um, limited grounds and um, for reasons of substantial public interest. What is substantial public interest, honestly? Because it says basis of EU or national law. So national law, it means that every EU state decides. Um, yeah, I'm honestly disappointed. I, I, should, I believe it should be banned. And um, it doesn't look like that's the intention of the EU Commission and hence I'm disappointed. Yeah, that's all I can say about it. Then let me just close up this discussion with uh, what I think is the next interesting point, which is how are they planning to do it? And if you are working in a highly regulated industry, be it pharma, be it medtech, be it aviation, be it automobile, this will come to you as no surprise. So they are saying we are going to have a conformity assessment procedure. And most likely we're going to have bodies nominated for that. So we are talking here about our 
notified bodies, the ones you find in Nando, for instance, that they will be now nominated for this new um, AI regulatory framework. So nothing new, you will have a conformity assessment procedure, you will undergo probably a certification pathway, you will have to pay for it. So again, a problem for SMEs, and then you will get certified. Um, and then here, they also introduce some considerations if some of the requirements are not possible to verify them a priority. So basically, um, some discussion about it, but for someone in a highly regulated industry, to be honest, not much new. Um, what I think it's also interesting is to say, well, what happens for the applications that use AI, but they are not in scope, then they will require, or they seems they will require voluntary labeling. And that's fun because it's also the first time, the first thing that was asked about drugs. There was a time where um, the pharma industry was not regulated at all. And the first thing they asked for was for liability. And then the second thing was labeling so that you at least knew what was the thing that you were swallowing. Um, so yeah, I see a lot of parallelisms here. Um, I think overall an interesting read. Um, I hope you found this opinion interesting. And um, yeah, the last comment I want to make is that you can submit feedback. Um, um, I think it's important that we as European citizens give feedback and, um, and you can do it here. And you have time until the 19th of May, so hurry up. <laughs> um, yeah, so that was from my side. Um, I, I would really like to know your opinion about this white paper. If you agree with some of my points, if you disagree, if you would add some others. I tried to go over it fast. I thought you found it interesting and yeah, happy to virtually meet you. Ciao, ciao.